One of the classical figures who was most popular with Renaissance architects was Vitruvius, who theorized that the proportions of buildings should reflect the proportions of the human body. He didn't provide any surviving pictures, but his work led to this drawing, sometimes called Vitruvian Man, the one I just mentioned is also called Divine Proportion by Leonardo. Leonardo's contemporary, Francesco de Giorgio, whom he much admired, is now not well known, but like Leonardo himself, he was an amazing polymath. Here's one of the illustrations from his work that makes the Vitruvian point. And here's another drawing by him, and now matched up with Leonardo's, to which it's obviously very similar. De Giorgio's work was apparently in Leonardo's possession by the time he made his own Vitruvian Man. We're going to see more of Leonardo's drawing now, and this is one of some acorns and oak leaves in the Windsor collection. And while we see these things, we'll hear a song by Marchetto Cara, one of the most popular songwriters of Leonardo's day, and was working for Isabella d'Este in Mantua when Leonardo visited there in 1500, as we'll see in just a bit. The song is called Non è tempo di aspettare. This is no time to wait. It is sometimes suggested that Leonardo failed to generalize from all the information he acquired and recorded, but he did apparently originate, or at least independently restate, some important theories, such as, for example, that one can tell the age of a tree when it was cut down by counting the growth rings in the trunk. Here are some flowers he drew. He also proposed a theory of phototropism. Plants will grow toward light. These are insects preserved in amber. He also devoted a lot of pages to the theory that there are fossils of sea life in the Apennines because the Apennines were once underwater. He must have had a cat, I think, and maybe a pet dragon, too. He drew every bone in the human body and probably had a better grasp of anatomy and physiology than any Swatizant doctor of his day. He was the first man to attempt to depict what an unborn child would look like in the womb. Here's a different kind of thing altogether, a, a catapult, a giant bow and arrow, the sort of thing Ludovico Sforza might have liked. This is a drawing he made of a double staircase occupying just one stairwell constructed so that those going up don't run into those going down. There is a staircase like this at the Chateau de Chambord in the Loire Valley in France, which some think might have been based on Leonardo's idea. He was fascinated his whole life with the possibility of flight, though it's unlikely anything he drew was ever, to, able, to, ever able to get off the ground. This is a kind of helicopter. But if he ever got up in that, he might have needed one of these to get down. The chateau to which he eventually retired at Amboise in the Loire Valley has a sort of museum in the basement which displays models of some of the things he drew, like this parachute. Just as Leonardo has a lot in common with the painters of the 17th century in his use of things like chiaroscuro and landscape and facial expression, it's sometimes said that his curiosity and inventiveness put him closer in spirit to people like Galileo and Newton than to the people of his own age. <laughs> 
I think there's something to this, but Leonardo was contemporary with some pretty curious and inventive people himself, including Copernicus, Columbus, and Gutenberg. This is another view of some of the things in the Cloluce or Clue Museum. Voglio far miraculi, says Leonardo. I want to create miracles. And he is often given credit for inventing such things as the ball bearing, the flintlock pistol, the adjustable lamp wick, the flip-top toilet seat, the transverse flute, the camera obscura, the submarine, the ratchet and flywheel. But the extent to which Leonardo actually made working models of these things isn't clear. And if he didn't actually make working versions of these things, should he get credit for inventing them? Many of the things he drew were not altogether new in any case. There are precedents, in some cases going back as far as classical antiquity, for at least a large number of the mechanical contrivances he put in his notebooks. This is one last look at the Cloluce Museum. This is a kind of mileage counter. Sometimes even Leonardo, genius that he was, also failed to extrapolate from an apparently insignificant mechanical effect to its potential. He made steam-powered toys, for example, but didn't see that what powered the toy could power the Industrial Revolution. This is a drawing of a warrior which is now in the British Museum. Kenneth Clark thinks this is an early drawing based on a bust of Darius by Verrocchio, and given his reputation, Sir Kenneth must have had some evidence for his claim, but I don't know what it is. In fact, there is a clear resemblance between the subject of this drawing and the subject of the portrait by Leonardo in Red Chalk in Turin, and there's a further resemblance, as I mentioned earlier, between them and the fellow in the divine proportion drawing we saw just before the break. Look at this montage and see what you think. There is certainly enough resemblance here for these to all be the same subject, albeit at different ages and from different angles. Notice also the angry lion, the leone ardito on the warrior's breastplate. It has been pointed out that this could well be a kind of signature for Leonardo, Leonardo. However, it's one he used nowhere else, which would indicate to me that instead of a signature which would say, I drew this, it's rather an identification of the subject himself. Why then doesn't he use it to identify himself in the divine proportion drawing? Maybe because he can't. He's stark naked. Whether this is Leonardo or not, Ludovico could have used some people like this warrior in 1499 when the French invasion came. You may remember that Ludovico's father, Francesco, took over in Milan by force after the death of Filippo Maria Visconti. Louis XII of France was the great-grandson of Filippo Maria's sister, Valentina, and claimed Milan, therefore, as his rightful patrimony. He also renewed the French claim on Naples. Ludovico was captured when his mercenaries deserted him, and Leonardo, feeling he was too closely associated with the Sforzas for safety, fled to Mantua. Ludovico was imprisoned in a dungeon, which you can see here at Loche in the Loire Valley for the rest of his life, reading over and over his copy of the Divine Comedy, which was the only thing he has to take with him. It is claimed that the graffiti on the wall in the place, which you can see now, was put there by Ludovico, the large inscription of which you can see a part says, I'm not happy, which does sound authentic enough, although Ludovico was not the only man to be imprisoned here, and few prisoners enjoy their dungeons. His body was later returned to Milan, and he was buried with his wife Beatrice in the Certosa di Pavia, which his great-grandfather Gian Galeazzo Visconti had built, and where he was also buried, as we saw earlier this quarter. The tomb is by Cristoforo Solari, the brother of the fellow who built Santa Maria della Grazie in Milan. Well, as I said, Leonardo fled to Mantua, where he apparently drew this sketch of Isabella d'Este Gonzaga, the wife of the Duke of Mantua, Gianfrancesco Gonzaga, 
and the sister-in-law of Ludovico, who had requested the portrait Leonardo painted of the latter's mistress, Cecilia Gallerani, we saw earlier. We know that he did make a portrait sketch of Isabella, but whether this is it or not isn't completely clear. In any case, he never got as far as the painting stage with the project. In connection with Mantegna's work for her, I mentioned that she was considered difficult to work for, and that might account for Leonardo's short stay in Mantua. Some also think he just didn't find her an interesting subject. She didn't inspire him, and so he couldn't paint her. But I don't know how inspiring he found the women he painted in Milan, either. I don't believe he ever mentions any woman in the 8,000 pages of his notebooks. In any case, she kept after him for years to finish the work, but he never did. She also tried to get Raphael Bellini and Titian to paint her portrait. But when Titian finally agreed to do one, she was 60 years old and said she didn't want to be painted looking 60. She wanted to look 30 again. Titian said, fine, I can do that. And in a couple of weeks, we'll see the picture itself. Leonardo went to Venice from Mantua, and although he only stayed there a few months, he is considered to have had a considerable influence on at least Giorgione, whose work we'll see in a couple of weeks. He then returned to Florence, which he had left nearly 20 years earlier, and moved into a house, the location of which is marked by the plaque here on the Via Martelli near the Piazza del Duomo. The Last Supper was already being regarded as one of the great paintings of the age, and Leonardo had no trouble getting work. Like the Bella Principessa we saw earlier, the so-called Salvatore Mundi, Jesus as Savior of the World, is the work now attributed to Leonardo by most scholars, and it's thought to have been painted soon after his return to Florence. One of the most visible things that points at Leonardo is the similarity between this drawing by him and the sleeve of the Salvatore Mundi. This picture is now in a private collection. Leonardo was commissioned by the Church of San Annunziata to make an altarpiece, and the Virgin, Child, and St. Anne in the Louvre was the result. By 1508, when he was invited to return to Milan by the art-loving French governor there, Charles Amboise, this was still not finished, and Leonardo apparently took it with him, but never did perhaps entirely finish it. The drape over the Virgin's legs, for example, seems to need some more work. The odd arrangement of the Virgin on her mother St. Anne's lap has provoked quite a bit of commentary. Freud suggests that this is a manifestation of the fact that Leonardo himself had two mothers, his father's mistress, who was his birth mother, and his legal mother, who was his father's wife. Kenneth Clark considers this explanation profound. I, on the other hand, consider it ridiculous. I don't know whether Leonardo ever saw it or not, or whether Freud or Kenneth Clark ever saw it, but there is a statue in the Bargello in Florence of the Virgin and Child on St. Anne's lap, although I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that because of this the unknown artist was illegitimate. Here's Leonardo's picture again. One would like to ask why he positioned the figures this way. Maybe it was just to emphasize a tender family feeling. I don't know. Not all questions have answers, especially in the arts. The landscape is one of the most ruggedly romantic Leonardo ever painted, and seems perhaps intended to be a contrast with, to set off all the more, the soft and smiling subjects. Here we can see the two women up closer, it is worth noting that they, as well as the baby Jesus, are smiling, because smiles on any faces are relatively rare before Leonardo, and Leonardo was working on this at the same time he painted the most famous smile in the history of art on Mona Lisa. If anything, St. Anne looks younger than her daughter, but anomalies like this are not uncommon in religious iconography. We'll see Michelangelo's Pietà next time, in which the Virgin certainly looks no older than her son. <laughs> 
All we know about the parents of the Virgin from the Bible is that she must have had them since she's alive. The Golden Legend, the common source for material on her family, which was used by Renaissance artists, says that Anna was married 20 years before Mary was born. So she must have been at least 50 when Jesus was born. Does she look that old? No, obviously not. But like Michelangelo's Pietà, this is like a representation of a vision, not a documentary photograph. The Burlington House cartoon, which you see now, is called The Greatest Drawing Ever Made by Kenneth Clark. This is apparently a preliminary study for the painting we just saw, although there are so many differences between them that it can almost count as something like an independent variation on the same theme. I think Bernard Berenson says somewhere that the face of St. Anne is barely endurable, meaning, I think, that it is just on the edge of saccharine prettiness, or does he maybe mean that it's barely endurable because it's in fact so beautiful? To me, it's the masterpiece in this masterpiece. We're going to see some close-ups of this picture. And we'll hear an anonymous North Italian Renaissance pavan. A pavan is a slow dance. Although human nature is complex, and geniuses are maybe more complex still than most of us, it still seems surprising that Leonardo could move so apparently easily from such sublime things as we've just seen to military engineering again. Sometime in 1501, he interrupted his work on the Virgin, the Child, and St. Anne, and went to work as Ingegnere Generale for the Pope Alexander VI's son, Cesare Borgia, the brother of the still more famous Lucrezia Borgia, about whom we'll hear more eventually. And this is thought to be a portrait sketch of Cesare by Leonardo. I'm not sure it is. Cesare was only 31 when he died in 1507, and couldn't have been more than about 26 when Leonardo did this, assuming Leonardo did it while he was working for him. And this fellow certainly looks much older. Here's an anonymous painted portrait of Cesare in the Palazzo Venezia in Rome, where it once formed part of Mussolini's collection. Alexander VI hoped that with his money and Cesare's ability, he would be able to unify all Italy under his control. Machiavelli thought this was not necessarily a bad idea, and acclaimed Cesare as the man most worthy of imitation in his day, until, that is, bad luck overtook him. In 1503, his father died, and he himself was ill at the time. Julius II, no friend of the Borgias, was elected the new pope, and Cesare had to run for his life, finally getting killed in a skirmish in France. Since he probably murdered one brother as well as a brother-in-law, the extent to which he should be imitated is open to question, but from an historian's point of view, he was a fascinating character, and historians, and most of the rest of us too, tend to treat history itself the way we treat works of art. What matters is not morality or goodness, 
not necessarily even beauty. What we value is the memorable, the impressive, the moving, and the interesting. Macbeth wouldn't be a better play in any meaningful sense if Macbeth didn't murder Duncan. And history wouldn't be better in any meaningful sense without Cesare Borgia. Just as, just as the older a man-made thing is, the more likely it is to be treated as a work of art, so the farther away from us in history a man is, the more likely we are to treat him as an actor in the anonymous drama we call history. This is a map of Imola, which Leonardo made, one of the few surviving results of his employment in the service of Cesare. It's amazingly accurate. If you put a modern map of Imola down over it, the walls match exactly. I think maybe this is evidence he did fly. While working for Cesare, Leonardo became friends with one of his generals, Villazzo Vitelli, for whom he may actually have made this map. And when the latter was assassinated on Cesare's orders for allegedly plotting against the Borgias, Leonardo gave up his job and went back to Florence. Here's a portrait now by Sani de Tito, a minor artist, of Niccolo Machiavelli, who served for a while as something like Florentine ambassador to Cesare, and who met Leonardo as a result. When the Medici were overthrown in 1494 and Piero Soderini became the head of the government, Machiavelli became his right-hand man. When the Medici returned to power in 1512, he not only lost his job but nearly his life and was reduced to poverty. But this gave him time to write his magnum opus, Il Principe, The Prince, which has at least somewhat unfairly made his name synonymous with political amorality. What in his book is at least essentially descriptive has superficially been taken to be prescriptive. His purpose was not to glorify unscrupulous power mongering, but to describe the tactics that historically had proven successful in the pursuit of power, and loving thy neighbor as thyself was not one of those tactics. To be successful as a ruler, if not as a neighbor, he says one has to learn how not to be good. That there is a certain amount of hero worship in the book is undeniable, I think, however. Machiavelli clearly did admire people like Cesare and Ferdinand of Aragon, and this does help explain the reputation the book has gotten. As I said, he had met Leonardo while both were with Cesare, and after both were back in Florence, Machiavelli was instrumental in getting him the opportunity to paint what might have been the Florentine equivalent to the Last Supper in the Room of the 500 here in the Palazzo Vecchio. In fact, Michelangelo had been commissioned to paint the opposite wall, the left one in this picture, and had each finished his work, this room would now be regarded as one of the great places in the history of art. Unfortunately, Michelangelo never got so far as to put any paint on his wall at all before going off to work for Julius II in Rome, and Leonardo again experimented with media that wouldn't stick to his wall. As a result, what we now have is the mediocre work of Vasari and Company, painted in the 16th century. The subjects of Michelangelo and Leonardo were to be the battles of Cascinan and Ghiari, and this is a sketch by Leonardo, which is probably a preliminary study for what he wanted to paint. And if something like this had gotten finished, the Baroque era of Sturm and Drang might now be said to have begun in 1500 instead of 1600. This is a far cry from the dance-like, stylized, and basically unemotional battle scenes of people like Piero della Francesca and Paolo Cello. It is significant that when Rubens himself, the quintessential Baroque painter, came to Italy a century later, he took infinite pains to make this copy of what was perhaps Leonardo's cartoon for the centerpiece of the action, 
the Battle of the Standard. The tumultuous writhing of the men and the horses in Leonardo's picture must have made Rubens, the master of tumultuous writhing, think, now that's more like it. In this picture, Leonardo pretty much out Rubens himself. And the faces, too, even if the grimaces are a bit stylized in perhaps almost a cartoonish way in their fury, are far from 15th century serenity. And speaking of faces, while Leonardo was working on ideas for the Battle of Anghiari, he was also painting the most famous of all faces, Mona Lisa's. And there she is from about as close as most tourists can get to her. Elisabetta del Giocondo, or Mona, or Mona, that is the Lady Lisa, or La Gioconda, was the wife of a prosperous Florentine merchant who eventually became a member of the seniory. She would have been about 24 in 1503 when Leonardo began work on her portrait, on which he did work, apparently requiring dozens of sittings, until he took it with him to Milan in 1506, claiming it was unfinished. He never, in fact, gave it up to the Giocondas. Vasari praises the rosy and pearly naturalness of the skin tones, which are today buried under centuries of dirt and varnish, to the extent that Kenneth Clark refers to her now as the submarine goddess of the Louvre. The Louvre curators say it's too dangerous to try and clean the picture, but I think they may also be worried that a rosy and pearly Mona Lisa might be too much for us. Bit of a shock. Vasari also mentions what he calls the divine smile, and it is this expression, so different in character from the deadpan looks of most 15th century portraits, that makes the picture especially memorable, along with the direct look right at the viewer, and of course the technical mastery of the whole execution, which Vasari says is just enough to make other painters give up. The smile, well, it's been said she's smiling because she's pregnant, or say others because she's not pregnant. Lawrence Durrell says this is the smile of a woman who has just eaten her husband. Vasari says she's smiling because Leonardo hired musicians to keep her happy during all the posing sessions. As I mentioned last time, I think the ancestors of this smile can be found in Verrocchio's studio and if Leonardo really posed for the Bronze David, it might be that in some sense this is his own smile. An awful lot has, of course, been written about this picture and the smile. Probably the most famous commentary is in Walter Pater's essay, which argues that this is, in effect, not any particular woman, really, but woman with a capital W, the representative of all femininity of all sorts, from Helen of Troy to the Virgin Mary. Whatever you think of Pater's essay, however, probably the stupidest essay on the picture was written a few years ago by a woman who argued that it is actually a self-portrait, which is very different from saying that in some sense, a sense more philosophical and anatomical, Leonardo's own smile is on her face. I won't even mention this woman's name, lest it be remembered when it should be forgotten. What you can learn from it is that if you keep an open mind, people will try to throw trash in it. One of this woman's most emphasized pieces of evidence is this juxtaposition. Looks convincing, right? The nose and mouth and all seem to match up exactly. Just age Mona by about a hundred years and you'll have Leonardo. Actually, however, it's well known to Leonardo insiders that he really had my son Jack in mind when he painted the picture. While we look at Mona Lisa up a little more closely now, we're going to continue to hear this song by Marchetto Cara, a popular songwriter, especially in northern Italy in Leonardo's day, someone Leonardo himself almost certainly knew. The song is O mia cieca e dura sorte, O blind fate. 
1506, Leonardo was invited to return to Milan by the French governor, Charles d'Amboise. It's hard to know what Leonardo worked on in the time he spent there, and he made at least a couple of trips to Florence before leaving Milan for Rome after the French were forced to evacuate Milan in 1512. The London version of the Madonna of the Rocks was likely finished during this period, and several other pictures which apparently don't survive are also mentioned in various documents. He also made another attempt to cast a monumental equestrian statue for Charles d'Amboise's successor, a Travolzio. It's also possible that this John the Baptist, now in the Louvre, was done in Milan, though some think it was done after he moved to Rome. Kenneth Clark considers it his latest surviving painting. Almost no one likes it, but Kenneth Clark is convinced it's his work. In Rome, Leonardo hoped to get work from the Medici Pope Leo X, who gave him an apartment in the Belvedere Palace, but nothing came of this opportunity. However, most think it was about the time of his arrival in Rome that he did one of his best-known drawings, the so-called Red Chalk Portrait, now in the Turin Royal Library. If this was drawn in 1512, Leonardo would have been 60. This man looks at least 70, and really more like 80, I think. There is, in fact, little hard evidence to justify the claim that this is a self-portrait. In any case, if this is Leonardo, as I argued earlier, then so is the guy in the Divine Proportion drawing, and certainly the guy in the Warrior drawing. It is often said that this is a portrait of Leonardo by his friend Francesco Melzi, which, if true, means, of course, that the previous one isn't Leonardo, and there are other alleged portraits of Leonardo as well. In 1515, when the French retook Milan, Francis I, Louis XII's successor, invited L Leonardo to take up residence in a chateau he would provide for him, just a stone's throw from the Chateau d'Amboise in the Loire Valley. And taking the Virgin Child and St. Anne, the John the Baptist and Mona Lisa with him, he left for France and never saw Italy again. This is the chateau of Clou or Clos Lucet, which Francis did turn over to Leonardo, as it looks today. As I mentioned earlier, it is a museum now, and it has a display of some of Leonardo's inventions, if we can call them that, in the basement. As far as we know, he did no painting here, and was only required to converse with the king when the latter was in an intellectual mood. He died here in 1519, not, however, as Vasari says, in the arms of Francis, who was far away at the time. Leonardo was buried where this statue of him stands on the grounds of the nearby Chateau d'Amboise, but when much later it was decided to move his bones into the chapel of Saint Hubert a few yards away, no one could make sure which bones buried here were his. As a result, the largest skull and the accompanying bones were chosen on the assumption that Leonardo must have had a large head to hold what must have been a large brain. Maybe, but I think Leonardo still lies here, and probably the bones of the king's blacksmith are now in the chapel. Perhaps the most successful Florentine portraitist and fresco painter of the late 15th century, the period during which Leonardo was in Milan, was Domenico Ghirlandaio, whose most well-known picture is this one in the Louvre, called The Old Man and the Boy, or some variant of that. The subject is actually apparently the banker Francesco Sassetti. Ghirlandaio was at the height of his career about 1480, just as Leonardo was beginning his, and one might expect some influence from Ghirlandaio to show up in Leonardo's portraits, but it's difficult to point to anything specific. The inclusion of Sassetti's grandson in the picture gives Ghirlandaio an opportunity to put some subtle tenderness in the old man's expression, however, that makes it one of the more memorable 15th century portraits. <laughs> 
Somewhere I've encountered a medical explanation for his appearance, the details of which I've forgotten, but I think his problem was diagnosed as more cosmetic than life-threatening. This is another portrait by Ghirlandaio, this time probably but not certainly of Lorenzo de' Medici's mother, Lucrezia Tornabuoni, for whose family Ghirlandaio did quite a bit of work, including the fresco we saw earlier with Poliziano and Ficino in it in the Tornabuoni Chapel at Santa Maria Novella. This is far less impressive than his portrait of Sassetti. Bernard Berenson says that Ghirlandaio didn't have a spark of genius. And whether or not that's true, uh, this has, I think, only the feeblest spark of life. Earlier we saw the picture of St. Augustine, which Botticelli painted in the Vespucci Chapel at Ognissanti. And this is Ghirlandaio's picture of St. Jerome, also in the same chapel. They were apparently painted as part of the same commission and almost looked like the same artist could have done both. And in 1481, both Botticelli and Ghirlandaio were invited to the Vatican by Pope Sixtus IV, Lorenzo de' Medici's former antagonist, to paint pictures on the walls of the Sistine Chapel, which he, Sixtus, had built as his private chapel and which is named for him. On the wall there, this is Ghirlandaio's calling of the apostles, Peter and Andrew in the foreground, James and John then in the distance. This calling of the apostles looks like it's taking place on Lake Geneva rather than the Sea of Galilee, however. By the magic of artistic license, about a dozen prominent Romans are represented as present, and while the apostles are being called to be fishers of men, I suspect Ger Gerlandio here of fishing for portrait commissions. The Gospels don't say Jesus sold tickets to this event. By 1485, Ghirlandaio was back in Florence working for the Tornabuoni family again at Santa Maria Novella and painting the birth of the Virgin with Ludovica Tornabuoni, Lorenzo de' Medici's cousin, at the front of the ladies-in-waiting. She was to die in childbirth and was pregnant at the time Ghirlandaio painted this picture. By the time Ghirlandaio was finishing work on these frescoes, the 13-year-old Michelangelo Buonarroti had become his apprentice in 1488, and it is likely that the young Michelangelo helped at least some here with the mechanical side of the wall preparation, color mixing, and so on. Here's the visitation by Ghirlandaio at Santa Maria Novella, and some think that Michelangelo might have actually helped paint parts of these pictures, uh, some, for example, attribute the stocky boys at the upper left to him. And some attribute the figure of the young John the Baptist here to him. This is in the same chapel at Santa Maria Novella. There is, in fact, however, little to support these attributions, except the feeling that Michelangelo must have done some fresco painting before he did the Sistine Chapel. Can a man who had never painted a fresco before have painted the greatest one ever on his first try? Well, even if Michelangelo did paint these few figures, that's essentially what Michelangelo was to do when he began the Sistine ceiling, paint the greatest one ever on his first try. And this is where Michelangelo was born, at Caprese, southeast of Florence. The Buonarotti family had been, at one time, quite distinguished, but by the time his wife gave birth to Michelangelo here, the best job his father had been able to find was an appointment as Podesta, the Medici agent here for a year, after which he returned to Florence. His wife was unable to nurse the new baby for some reason, and so the infant Michelangelo was sent to live with a wet nurse in Settignano, where his father owned a small farm. The nurse's husband worked in a nearby quarry, where Michelangelo as a boy then got his first experience with a hammer and a chisel. When his mother died at about 25, his father remarried, and Michelangelo, by this time about 10, went to live with them in Florence, where he made the acquaintance of several young apprentice artists, including Francesco Granacci, who was in the workshop of Ghirlandaio. Signore Buonarrate was less than enthusiastic about a member of the family becoming what he considered 
a manual laborer, but Michelangelo was not to be denied, and his father finally agreed to sign the required contract that put Michelangelo also among Ghirlandaio's pupils. According to Vasari, Michelangelo made a painted copy of an engraving of the Torment of St. Anthony by Schongauer, Martin Schongauer, soon after he was apprenticed to Ghirlandaio. So this would apparently have been done when he was only 13 years old or so. This picture now in the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth is generally acknowledged to be the painting of which Vasari speaks. We have no evidence that Michelangelo did any sculpture while he was apprenticed to Ghirlandaio, but he must have done some because in 1489, when Lorenzo de' Medici established a sculpture school under the directorship of Bertoldo, Ghirlandaio recommended him as a student and Vasari says that Lorenzo de' Medici himself was so impressed by the still just 14 year old sculptor that he gave him an apartment in the Palazzo Medici itself across the street and made his father a customs agent. Bertoldo had the student sculptors make sketches of various masterpieces in Florence, and some of the ones Michelangelo made survive, including this drawing of St. Peter paying the tax collector from Masaccio's tribute money at Santa Maria della Carmine. Vasari says that it was while Bertoldo's class was here at the Carmine that an older student, Pietro Torrigiano, got into a fight with Michelangelo and broke his nose, for which crime he was banished from Florence by Lorenzo. Torrigiano went on to have quite an interesting career himself, however, in England, where he made the tomb of Henry VII, and in Spain, where he made this St. Jerome. Unfortunately, his fight with Michelangelo was not the last he was to have, and although he was a sculptor of real talent, he wound up dying in a jail in Seville. <laughs> Vasari mentions a wooden crucifix which the young Michelangelo made for the Church of Santo Spirito. And since 1963 it has been claimed in some quarters that this is that very work which is now in the Casa Buonarotti Museum. Some think that it is in fact the earliest surviving work by Michelangelo as a sculptor. The fact that it is new does suggest Michelangelo, but it hardly has the Michelangelesque physique we associate with his style. Another work of sculpture in that museum, the Madonna of the Stairs, is more generally considered the earliest surviving student work, and certainly does have more of the look we associate with him. The Virgin is monumental, and the baby Jesus looks like he could grow up to be David. Even more typical of the future Michelangelo, perhaps, is this other student work, The Battle with the Centaurs, also in the Casa Buonarotti Museum. In 1492, Lorenzo the Magnificent died, and the sculpture school was closed, and Michelangelo left the Palazzo Medici and returned to the house of his father, whose first words to him were probably, I told you so. I said you should have given up that art stuff and gotten an MBA. Lorenzo's son Piero did, however, give him his first recorded commission. In January 1494, Florence got a big snowfall and Michelangelo was hired to make a giant snowman for the courtyard of the Palazzo Medici. Unfortunately, this earliest known paid commission does not survive. This is where his father's house was, on the Via Benacorte near Santa Croce in Florence. The plaque on the wall near the corner marks the address. Later in 1494, as we've heard, earlier this quarter, Piero had to run for his life to get away from the French, and Michelangelo, thinking he had been too closely associated with the Medici for safety, fled as well. Okay, that's where we'll wind up this lecture and go on with Michelangelo's adventures and the rest of his career next week, and we'll hear about Raphael as well. Mm -hmm.